Hello, everyone. We're going to begin our session now. I am director of Sungshil Institute for Peace and Unification. My name is Hong Bae Kim. I have given the role of the moderator for this session. Our session, as you know, is under the theme of implementing SDGs and direction for development cooperation with North Korea based on SDG 3 and 5. Again, there's an emphasis on the SDG 3 and 5. Uh, I think this is a rather unique title. I think everyone is aware of what SDGs are, but uh, perhaps SDG 3 and 5 and the focus on it uh, is something that uh, perhaps requires explanation. As you know, uh, UN, in order to make the future a better place, uh, there were a number of goals that were set, which are called the SDGs. And there are 17 areas. And for each area, there are targets. Uh, 169 targets have been identified. And in order to understand whether they are actually implemented, there are 232 indicators uh, which are measured to understand the progress. So of the 17 SDGs, we are going to focus on three and five. Uh, the reason why we have specifically identified SDG 3 and 5, well, yesterday, yesterday there was a session on SDG, and the Korean Healthcare Research Institute had organized a session on that, and they looked at the healthcare situation and the opportunities for inter-Korean cooperation. And they focused on SDG 1, uh, poverty alleviation, and also health care. Uh, there is uh, some overlap with what we're going to cover today in this session. Uh, but there's one more specific thing about our session, because we have a focus on women and the issue of gender equality. And we're going to deal with uh, welfare and health care issues with some focus on women. Uh, so I provided an explanation about the theme of this session because it's very specific. Uh, but I think my role uh, for today is to introduce the presenters and the discussants. And of course, time management is my major uh, role. And if necessary, I may provide some uh, summary of uh, takeaways from this session at the end. Usually, when we have these sessions, we often have delays. But um, I don't know, perhaps fortunately, uh, one speaker actually was not able to attend today. So we have more time uh, for each of the presenters and the discussants. So we will have uh, the presenters go first and then the discussion to follow. As you know, through YouTube channel and Zoom, we are streaming this live. So you can actually post questions if you are accessing us via online. So there's a, uh, and with regards to Q&A, we have a QR code available for you, which you can use to uh, post questions. And as you probably know, we are providing simultaneous interpretation throughout the session. So you can use uh, the interpretation services available. Now, I would like to introduce the presenters and the discussants just briefly. So the three presenters are, uh, first we have with us Dr. Gina Kwon uh, from Korea University. She's sitting right next to me. She's going to talk about gender, health, well-being, and development in North Korea.
And right next to Dr. Kwon is Dr. Jiun Kim, who is Deputy Director of Daesung Oriental Medicine Hospital. She is known as one of the first scholars to study the Korean traditional medicine from both South Korean and North Korean traditions. And uh, she's going to talk about application of and practical possibilities for SDGs in the DPRK. Now, next to her is the officer in charge of UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and Seoul, uh, Mr. Imesh Pokharel. And he is going to talk on the topic of international human rights mechanisms and women's right to health in the DPRK. And after the three presentations, we also have two very distinguished discussants who will comment on the presentations. Next to Mr. Pokharel, we have with us Dr. Shin Gun Kim of Korea University College of Medicine. And right next to Dr. Kim is Dr. Patricia Getty uh, of Sungkyunkwan University who will also provide her comments. Uh, of course, there's a lot more to say uh, to actually introduce uh, these presenters uh, and discussants, but in the interest of time, I have shortened the introductions. So you can actually refer to their curriculum vitae in the conference uh, book. Now, uh, we will now hear from Dr. Gina Kwon on gender, health, well-being, and development in North Korea. Uh, just to uh, lay out the rule of the game here, each presenter, uh, because we have 120 minutes total, we I will give 25 minutes to each presenter. Uh, so that will take 75 minutes just for the three presentations. And then the discussants will be given 10 minutes each. And then through YouTube and Zoom, uh, questions that are shared through these two channels uh, will be addressed. So I think that will be enough uh, for the two hours. Hey. Um, because I am going to, I'm going to be providing an overview in English. To all the respected guest speakers and virtual audience from everywhere today, it is my great honor to be here with each one of you and contemplate on the common goal of genuine peace in the Korean Peninsula. When Professor Kim Sung-bae uh, suggests me this chance of meeting these experts and organizing this particular session, session on the SDGs, I was more than happy for this chance of inviting the specialists here and learning from their expertise on gender, health, and development in North Korea. Facing this unprecedented time with COVID-19, the importance of health is ever increasing in the development area. While many points on the health and welfare sector were dealt in yesterday's session already, I want to narrow down our focus to gender issues and think about the concrete direction of humanitarian works in the broader perspective of development in the longer term. So as pointed out by the international community, community for a long time, gender equality is crucial when we initiate and implement development plans. Without sensitivity to gender equality, we miss out the half of the world's population in development works and dismiss the issues on women, particularly the one in patriarchal societies, who can affect the conditions of children, family, the community, and eventually the future of a country. In addition to mentioning the importance of fundamental human rights that are ensured in the Universal De Declaration of Human Rights, women's health is an issue of life, the most fundamental principle we can never give up in, in any circumstance.
It is also a timely topic with the rising Me Too movement world around and an opportune theme when we talk about development and peace in North Korea, which also relates to women, peace, and security frame relating to the Resolution 1325. Women's rights is also one of the few areas where Democratic People's Republic of Korea has been making some efforts uh, from the beginning of its establishment. As you can see uh, from, from this slide, North Korea established various laws uh, on gender, and equal, gender equality from its start. Uh, you can see the list of the laws here uh, that starts from 1946, uh, that's just right after the start beginning of the North Korean regime. Uh, though we shall never close our eyes to the various criticisms on what is actually taking place on the side of optimism and hope for the, for the purpose of cooperation, we can find that North Korea has shown continuous efforts to improve gender equality. It ratified the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, CEDAW, in 2001, and submitted the first and the second to fourth combined reports until now. In response to the paragraph 22nd of the concluding comments of the CEDAW, the DPRK adopted the law on the protection and promotion of the rights of women in 2010. Such works show, though it may be nominal, the country has made systematic efforts concerning gender equality and getting involved in the international community in, a say, in the way they, they can do. Such efforts are also reflected in the SDG report. Um, according to the Sustainable Development Report to 2020 by the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, SDSN, North Korea is relatively doing well in gender equality compared to other sustainable development goals. So as you can see, this is a list of the North, East, South Asian countries uh, in, in the report of the SDSN. And the third one is the North Korea. Uh, so as you can see from the slide here, among, many, among the 17 goals, so 17 areas uh, where North Korea has been trying to make a progress, gender, you can see that it, it is, uh, it is indicated with a gender, gender equality is indicated with, with, with a yellow circle, which means uh, there is still some challenges remain. Uh, that's the second, uh, second that, that indicates the second goal or uh, second rank of the whole progress uh, in, in the, in the, in among, among the four criteria of the report. So while there are many red and orangey uh, circles around, you can see that gender equality is, a, is, a, is an area where North Korea is relatively well doing. However, the gap between the system and reality is still vast. Various academic research papers, reports from NGOs, research, and international organizations, including the OHCHR, we are here with the image, but, and the t testimonies of people from North Korea tell us that many people are unaware of the existence of laws or concepts of human rights. It is no exception for women's rights in the DPRK. Um, as I have been meeting many North Korean women in my course of research and work, many of them told me that domestic violence is very prevalent in North Korea. As it is an issue with many other countries, the implementation of the system is the most challenging part of North Korea. Regardless of the SDGs, the set in holistic approach, the SDG frame has been criticized for too many targets and indicators that lead to nowhere without focus. Well, I, I illustrated the targets and indicators of the SDGs, but I couldn't even cover the half of the indicators actually here. Uh, such condition requires us to be strategic. Uh, it calls for a concentration in focusing areas, which would bring improvement in other areas eventually. After all, achieving the one goal requires multifaceted efforts from various areas, which necessarily includes many other goals work in tandem. No one goal in the SDGs can survive on its own. Having said that, this particular session will focus on SDG 3 and 5, 
good health, well-being, and gender equality, with a broader consideration of the overall development process in North Korea. Improving the environment for women's health is not only about issues on women per se, as mentioned, it is ultimately about sustainable development and inclusive growth. Saying that, development in women's health shall not end as a short-term plan, but it should be a long-term plan that can embrace and empower the, the both of the genders without exclusivity in the process of the development of North Korea. With all these points as background, I would like to open this session to the respected uh, experts here, uh, here with me. And since, since Professor uh, Song Bae Kim already went through uh, the introduction of all, the, all these experts, I'll, perhaps I may just uh, introduce our uh, Professor Kim Song Bae. Um, he's a um, He's, a, he's the urbanologist with his lifelong passion in urban planning and North Korea. He's a professor of public administration in Song Sheil University's College of Social Science and a director of Song Sheil Institute for Peace and Unification. Well, so now I will finish my part here and give my stage to the respected experts here with us today. Thank you. Next, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Jiun Kim. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Jiun Kim. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity you know, due to COVID-19 and also the typhoons, the heavy rains and cyclones. You know, things have been rather hectic for everyone. And for me to be able to participate in a forum which discusses uh, opportunities to improve the quality of life in North Korea and for the uh, North Korean people uh, is, is um, a, a great opportunity. And I'm really great that this forum has been organized. And it's an honor for me to have been given this chance to participate in this session. I have left North Korea for some time, uh, some time now. so. Um, SDG since 2015 to 2030, uh, they will be pursued and many indicators have been suggested and we are going to focus on number three and five. So I would like to speak as a doctor who formerly worked in North Korean healthcare sector uh, to outline what uh, medical legislation, le legislative environment is like and what kind of healthcare system is in place in North Korea. And then more recently, since uh, the Kim Jong-un administration came into power, the direction of development of healthcare system has shifted a bit. So I would like to talk about that. And finally, uh, you know, there are the SDGs. So in order to promote SDGs in North Korea, uh, you know, this requires effort. So I would like to look at the potential for achieving the SDGs effectively in North Korea. So I'd like to have that discussion with you today. So uh, this is the uh, list of topics I would like to cover today. And the health of women and health of children, how is this promoted in North Korea? Uh, in order to understand that, I think you need to get an uh, overview of the healthcare system in North Korea. And I'm sure you have read uh, about this a bit in the media. But uh, generally, there are three components, the free medical care, uh, there is the medical district system, and the prevent preventive medicine. Now, free medical care sounds great. Uh, and uh, uh, in, although uh, in reality in North Korea, 
it's uh, one of the reasons why that health care has not been effectively delivered uh, in North Korea right now. Actually, before the situation got worse in North Korea, free medical care uh, did play a significant part in 1945, uh, the health authority was established in the North Korean government. And in the 20 article program in the constitution, uh, they included some uh, provisions about the health care. And basically, it stipulates that the state is responsible for the health of its people. And also, there was a focus on maternal and infant health. Uh, and second aspect of DPRK's healthcare system is the medical district system. Uh, it's similar to the family doctor uh, system. So from cradle to death, there is this uh, doctor who is located in the neighborhood who takes care of the health of the people. So we could uh, potentially say this is uh, the neighborhood uh, family doctor system. Uh, but uh, your idea of the family doctor is a bit different from what uh, the system is like in North Korea. Uh, because in the other countries, you really have a choice as to who to choose as your family doctor. But in North Korea, you can't choose. The government designates and assigns doctors to be responsible for a particular neighborhood or a district. So they have districts and they assign doctors to be responsible for that particular district. So in that sense, uh, it's quite different from family doctors in other countries. And on this, I would like to explain further later on, uh, because this has significant implications for the health of women and the health of children, uh, because this impacts the access to health care. And uh, the third pillar of DPRK's healthcare is preventive medicine. Uh, this is actually at the core of DPRK healthcare system because their whole idea is that um, prevention is better than treatment after developing an illness. So there's a great focus on preventive medicine. Now, I talked about the medical. Uh, uh, district system. So e for each doctor, there are about 90 to 130 households assigned. So that's about 300 to 800 people that a single doctor oversees. So depending on the situation, uh, maybe in the city, uh, e each doctor could oversee the health of maybe a 1,000 people. But in the more remote areas and less populated areas, it could be maybe 300 patients per doctor. Uh, so what does this neighborhood doctor do? Um, be and this doctor is responsible t for providing uh, health care services, diagnosing, and uh, doing health checkups on the neighborhood's people. And also, this doctor is responsible for uh, disease control and prevention, and also doing some surveillance on epidemiological aspects of infectious diseases. Uh, and the doctors are responsible for overseeing the neighborhood. Uh, and because he or she has direct access to this neighborhood and conducts the epidemiological surveillance, this is done rather efficiently and quickly. And also, the doctor is responsible for providing explanations about the policies uh, sent down by the central health care authority. For example, with regards to COVID-19, uh, if information needs to be disseminated to the residents in the local community, it's the neighborhood doctor who goes out and provides explanation about the latest pandemic to the residents so they're able to listen to their own doctor explain about the latest health developments. 
And uh, in North Korea, ultimately, it's the uh, Labor Party that is in charge of everything. And this is the medical treatment system. There is the first treatment hospitals, second, third, and fourth. Uh, but uh, you know, there is no clear official um, terminology used to indicate which is primary, which is secondary, and which is tertiary. But depending on the condition of the patient, uh, that patient may be referred to higher um, care hospitals. And I believe uh, healthcare provision and the policies have shifted a bit since Kim Jong Un came into power. The medical, uh, the healthcare act has been revisioned over time. So there is an emphasis for treatment using validated scientific methodologies. And also, when an organ donation must be made, uh, the family member's permission must be uh, gotten by the um, hospital. So this is something that's been, uh, written, you know, newly added, and this is an emphasis on respect for human rights and um, respect for ethical aspects. So Kim Jong Un is uh, changing these aspects, and the key direction for developing healthcare in North Korea is modernizing the healthcare system. So a lot of modern facilities and hospital um, are being built. I think in March this year, the general hospital in Pyongyang is under construction. I believe they were trying to open this in October, but this will probably be delayed under the current circumstances. But anyhow, the Kim Jong Un administration is really trying to modernize the healthcare uh, system. And in uh, pursuing modernization and uh, bringing more science into the healthcare, uh, there's a lot of uh, infrastructure uh, improvement that they're trying to do with regards to the facilities. Uh, and actually, uh, it, you know, the med healthcare sector in uh, North Korea is still a bit backwards. So there is a lot of focus on modernizing the medical equipment. And I would like to explain about this numerical electrocardiograph. So th basically, using the s smartphone or by using the computer, you can uh, do ECG uh, measurement. So this is not a very novel technology per se, because already this is being utilized uh, because there is more advanced uh, medical equipment in Korea and in other countries, but at least North Korea is trying to make some steps to modernize uh, the things that they, uh, the technology they use uh, in the healthcare setting. And Chongjin Medical University is actually uh, my alma mater. Uh, and although I don't belong there uh, anymore, but a lot of the faculty and researchers at the Chongjin Medical University has been involved in developing that ECG technology that I mentioned. Uh, and also, there is an effort to modernize uh, the medication. So there is a lack of drugs uh, that are effective. And so Kim Jong-un has been emphasizing the, mo the modernization of drugs for e delivering effective treatment. I think one aspect we should focus on here is that these drug substances are not really uh, based on Western uh, pharmacology. These are actually using more oriental medicinal uh, ingredients. So in uh, North Korea, uh, there is an emphasis on having the Korean uh, medicine and Western medicine, uh, you know, combined and uh, delivered together in parallel. Uh, so this is one very unique aspect of North, care, uh, North Korea healthcare. So some people think that the uh, North Korea emphasizes Korean medication because their Western medicine isn't as developed. But actually, since 1947, they have, when they first established the healthcare ministry, they have been doing a lot of R&D uh, in the Korean medicine, uh, along with efforts in the Western medicine. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, Korean medicine is playing an important part in upholding uh, the healthcare system in DPRK. And another important aspect is the maternal and infant health care. Uh, women uh, and also patients in general are overseen by the neighborhood family doctor. But if the woman is pregnant or if uh, a woman has uh, sp diseases specific to women's, uh, there is also the OBGY doctor who consults with the family doctors to deliver effective uh, treatment. So in this case, the OBGY, uh, so and for the infants, one week after birth, it's the OBGY doctor who is responsible, but uh, one week after birth of the uh, infant, uh, that a referral is made to the family doctor uh, who will consult with OBGY and pediatric doctor to take care of this newborn uh, baby. So that's the infant health care system in North Korea. And there are legislations on maternal and child health Healthcare, for example, pre and post uh, maternity leave, shortened working hours for pregnant women. Uh, while North Korean economy was doing okay, uh, there was, uh, you know, no restriction on breastfeeding uh, at the daycare centers uh, while working, uh, and also the nurseries. Uh, were, uh, you know, there was adequate place uh, and capacity in the nurseries and kindergartens to accommodate uh, children. Uh, but uh, as the North Korean economy faltered, uh, you know, the situation in the daycare centers have uh, worsened a bit. Uh, and the there was a lengthening of maternity leave. So Previously, it was 77 days, uh, but uh, when I gave birth, uh, that was in the 1990s, um, that actually extended to 150 days. But more recently, uh, the maternity leave is provided up to 240 days. So there is significant effort to improve the health uh, of the infants and uh, the mothers. And also, there has been uh, much research done on nutrition of women of childbearing age. So academic journals featured uh, these types of uh, research papers, uh, which I've listed here. So there's a lot of research being done on the health of women uh, of childbearing age. But despite this, the uh, mother's fatality rate is quite high and birth rate is declining. And the maternal fatality rate uh, is relatively high. Uh, and uh, probably it's because of there is not enough uh, environment there to deal with uh, access uh, blood, um, blood uh, flow and also uh, and hemorrhage and also because of the failing economic conditions the nutritional condition of the women uh, tended to be uh, declining over time so this has an impact uh, and also there is a lowering con uh, birth rate and with regards to contraception uh, contraception by intrawom device accounts for the bulk of the contraception methods. And this data that I have listed on the slide is from a research done in 2014. So here it shows that contraception by intrawom device uh, is, has the lion's share of contraception. Uh, uh, condoms and uh, male sterilization is almost zero. And I think men are not really interested in doing anything to themselves uh, to uh, do contraception. 
Uh, now, with regards to birth rate, in the past it wasn't so low, but birth rate it continues to decline. And I think that's partly because of the declining economic conditions. And women also have to work very hard. And there's a lot of stress as a result. And when I interview people who have defected North Korea more recently, they're saying that more educated women and more professional women also think that, why do I have to be the one taking care of the family? And they really want to have an independent life on their own. And oftentimes, these more professional and higher educated women tend to eschew uh, um, having children. And the daycare center and nursery system is relatively uh, well provided. But women are more concerned about how to uh, support the children over time given the current circumstances. So although today we're focusing on health issues, there are also other issues concerning the livelihood uh, of the women and children. So I think that must be solved first in order for other issues to be resolved as well. Now, this data is about maternal uh, death rate. Until the early 1990s, at least DPRK's maternal death rate was lower than Vietnam, and it continued to grow until uh, we enter the new millennia. Uh, there is a tendency to drop. Uh, all the way down to 82 in 2015. Of course, compared to Korea uh, and US, it's quite high. And although uh, North Korea's uh, maternal death rate is uh, you know, lower than world's average, but still we need to uh, improve on this. And so, North Korea uh, is very concerned with maintaining the health of the infant. So there's a lot of research done on, for example, the new mother's expression of milk and promoting uh, breastfeeding. Uh, and this is also about infant health. And I was a pediatrician in North Korea uh, in the mid-1990s. And I believe that uh, most common conditions were for the children uh, were indigestion and diarrhea and also respiratory diseases and, and other illnesses. Now, indigestion and diarrhea, uh, clinically speaking, if uh, adequate care is uh, given, you know, we can actually we could have actually saved the children, but oftentimes under the limited healthcare environment in North Korea, sometimes even indigestion and diarrhea uh, could lead to um, death. Now, the healthcare system in North Korea uh, needs to improve. Uh, and I hope that this session today can help uh, provide ideas that could help the condition of healthcare system uh, to provide better care for women and children. Now, vaccination. So from the central authority to the very end uh, patients, uh, there is a systematic uh, approach to doing vaccination. Oftentimes, uh, they go to the schools uh, during in-class hours to vaccinate all the children. So you rarely have uh, children without getting uh, vaccinations. But why is that there is still in a lot of infectious diseases uh, spreading in North Korea? And that's probably because in the transportation from the central authority uh, to the very local schools, uh, there may be issues with the storage conditions of the vaccines and also the during the long transport uh, I think maybe the expiry date management uh, hasn't 
been done quite effectively. So the system itself uh, is quite stringent, stringently um, designed. So we have this whole record keeping system of the various vaccination that each person must get at which time in their lives. So there is a vaccination card belonging to each person and the family doctors, the, uh, the pedi uh, pediatrician uh, has these patient vaccination cards. And uh, although it's very rare that uh, North Korean residents move to another uh, region, uh, but when they do actually move to another you know, village or a city, they also need to take their vaccination card with them. Uh, and so there is this follow-up uh, and monitoring and tracking of vaccination. So the system uh, is in place, but the actual vaccination practices uh, are rather uh, limited, although the system itself is very well designed. So I hope that if the system can be implemented as effectively as it is designed, then we could significantly lower, um, you know, fatalities in North Korea. Now, this is the under five uh, death rate. Uh, again, it's uh, right now still lower than Vietnam, but it's not as low as Korea or U.S. But we see that uh, this death rate is declining. So this means that the situation is improving in North Korea, but there's, uh, of course, room for further improvement. Now, with regards to the SDGs, in order to apply the concept of SDGs in the North Korean context, is this possible at all? And when we you know, think about these goals, we often say, does this actually work? Or is this realizable in North Korea? And because of these doubts and suspicions, uh, people are discouraged from proactively taking action. Uh, but I think that if we look at North Korean society, yes, there are limitations and there are some backward practices. Still, there is a system in place. And also, there is a lot of, you know, um, market, think me market mechanisms being introduced in North Korea, but the public healthcare system is still intact. So what we need to do is make efforts so that that public healthcare system can uh, become more effective. If that effort is provided, perhaps North Korea might be able to improve its overall health care delivery uh, more quickly. And also, there are many dedicated people in the health care sector in North Korea. If we look at many emerging economies, uh, we often see very limited uh, and backward healthcare uh, environment. But one difference between North Korea and those other emerging economies is that uh, the general population's education level is relatively high. The illiteracy rate is very low. So I think in that sense, the overall environment is rather different from the other emerging economies. And North Korea has, uh, is very committed to participating in the pursuit of SDGs, especially for goals three and five. So in that sense, uh, I think there is a great potential for North, North Korea to make progress on achieving the SDGs. And human rights is a concept that North Korea uh, is not really uh, friendly towards. But uh, uh, if we use the word of right to health rather than, say, human rights outright, uh, perhaps we will be able to uh, achieve results without leaving anyone behind. Um, 
as I mentioned, that in healthcare in North Korea, the system itself is well organized, but the realities is very difficult, and there are limited access to drugs, and their facilities are backward, which is why many citizens avoid try to avoid uh, going to the hospitals. They think, oh, they will not have drugs at the clinic anyway, so they instead go to the black market. So this is what's happening, and. Uh, and whether, uh, given this situation, will it be possible to improve that healthcare system? Well, I would like to say that for 60 to 70 years, this healthcare has been intact, and people uh, have been using this system. I think there is still potential for reviving this healthcare system to really become more effective. And also uh, monitoring uh, is challenging. And often the international organizations and the NGOs say whether uh, North in North Korea these efforts will be effectively implemented. And yesterday I participated in some of the sessions uh, which covered the topic of international sanctions in North Korea. Uh, and there was talk of humanitarian aid and health care being uh, uh, exempt from the sanctions. And the American lawyer talked about that. Uh, and then there was a question uh, who followed, the question followed, then why is it the case that there's not enough humanitarian aid and the uh, health care support being provided? Uh, because there are, if there are proposals that are very clear, transparent, and detailed with regards to the healthcare supplies that are being uh, provided, then that proposal will be approved. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, again, is a big hurdle. Uh, so we, uh, so, we need to uh, have, on the one hand, the international community to make an effort, but also North Korea to be more readily accepting of the rules and guidelines uh, set by the international organizations. Uh, I am very grateful that I am actually participating in a forum where so many people who are concerned about North Korea uh, is here to talk about opportunities and efforts. And I hope that the discussions will actually lead to real meaningful efforts that can have a real impact on the health of women and children. So that is my sincere wish. Uh, and as I mentioned before, since Kim Jong-un came into power, modernization of healthcare has been a focus and there has been some shift in the healthcare system itself. But although there are efforts underway, they lack the medical equipment and facilities. They actually built a pharmaceutical factory, uh, but even with that factory, they need power to run the machines to manufacture. They need to have the raw materials, drug substances to actually make those factories operational. So there are these limitations. Uh, so North we need to help North Korea to themselves utilize the limited uh, resources that they have uh, and get the most out of what they have. And I think that would be helpful. Of course, South Korea and the international community have consistently tried to help North Korea uh, and the South Korean government and the people. I really urge them to uh, to have a continued interest and pay continued attention to the fate of North Koreans and the situation there. And most importantly, uh, the stumbling block is the political will of the North Korean leaders uh, and the North Koreans' um, you know, willingness to become more transparent towards the international organize, organizations is very important. They really should allow effective monitoring by the international organization and where these aid is going. Uh, and 
And uh, given that kind of transparency and political will, and if international organizations uh, in the community are willing to provide more support, I uh, really have high hopes that the situation in North Korea can improve. Uh, and so with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for keeping to the time. We will go on to the next presentation. Imesh Pokorel. Can I, can I have that? Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer, the Song Silly Institute for Peace and Unification for inviting our office to this important discussion. Uh, today I'll be presenting on how international human rights mechanisms has been advocating and promoting gender equality and women's right to health in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Many of us might be curious, does the DPRK even engage us with the international human rights mechanisms or on human rights issues? The answer is definitely yes, they do. <clears throat> While the engagement has not been very regular, uh, the country does continue to engage with different UN human rights mechanisms, primarily with the treaty bodies and the Universal Periodic Review. And with regards to the treaty bodies, which is basically the the laws, human rights laws. Uh, DPRK has, is a party to five core human rights treaties, which is on civil and political rights, the rights of persons with disabilities, economic, social, and cultural rights, uh, the discrimination against women, and rights of the child. Uh, it submitted its report uh, to the CEDAW committee, the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, and the Committee on the Child in 2016, and it was reviewed by the committee in 2017, and DPRK actively participated in that process. The DPRK has also submitted its report to the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in late 2018, so there could be a review of the country in um, most probably next year. Uh, that's, that's highly likely. So that's another forum that DPRK has, has been uh, engaging with. The committee on the Human Rights Committee, it has not been engaging with on the ICCPR rep reporting obligations. Uh, it uh, submitted, the last report it submitted was in 2001, uh, which was 17 years after the first report. So. DPRK at one time also wanted to get out of the, its obligations under um, civil and political rights, but the Human Rights Committee basically ruled that that was not possible. With economic, social, and cultural rights, it was reviewed in 2003, and it has not uh, submitted its report since then. Uh, we have been trying to engage with the DPRK and, and support them in, in reporting at least under the economic, social, and cultural rights. With regards to special procedures, which we also call special rapporteur, uh, there are two formats of special procedures. One is the thematic mandate, which is on different human rights themes. Uh, the special rapporteur on the rights of persons with disabilities was able to go to DPRK in May 2017. Uh, she was able to visit Pyongyang and uh, some towns in South Wangwei province. Uh, we have been encouraging DPRK to, uh, to at least engage with the thematic mandate holders and allow at, at least one theme, thematic mandate holder to visit. That was a discussion that they would allow um, the mandate holder on, on sanctions, unilateral sanctions, but that didn't happen last year. So uh, we'll have to follow up with the DPRK on that. Uh, the mandate of the special rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the DPRK, uh, the DPRK does not engage with, with, uh, with that mandate. While it um, it honest, it, I think with the, with, the, 
With that mandate, since it was established with the, on, under the Human Rights Council resolution, um, DPRK is of the position that any country-specific resolutions are biased and political, so on principle, on the ground, they, they do not engage with the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the DPRK. So that's where they engage with the Special Rapporteurs, uh, limited engagement, but they are open to engagement with the thematic uh, Rapporteurs, which they think uh, they can engage with. The other is the Human Rights Council, and, and that's one area where DPRK has been engaging, especially with regards to the Universal Periodic Review. And since this is a peer review by the member states and not by the experts, uh, they have been encouraging that that should be the principal forum for discussion uh, on human rights issues. Uh, so that's, that's the position. So they have, they have, they have been um, participating in that process. The Last year, they were reviewed by the UPR and they have agreed to 132 of the 262 recommendations by the member states. Uh, the Human Rights Council also have annual resolution on the human rights situation in the DPRK. However, again, since this is a country-specific resolutions, uh, the DPRK doesn't engage us in that process. With the OSHR office, they do engage with our office in, in Geneva, uh, but since uh, the sole office was established under the Human Rights Council resolutions, again, under the same principle, they do not engage with our office in Seoul, uh, but we had regular engagements, uh, meetings with the permanent mission in Geneva on a regular basis. And last year, we also had a small training on human rights to few members of the government. Um, and, and we are exploring if that could be extended. And, and there is an interest from DPRK on, on few issues like um, rights of person with disabilities, um, as well as reporting under the uh, treaty bodies uh, mechanisms. Uh, but since due to COVID, we couldn't do that this year. So if the COVID situation um, evolves in a, in, a, in, a, in a better situation, then I think we should be able to continue that discussion and maybe hold a few uh, trainings for the DPRK if they agree to again. Uh, the DPRK issues are also discussed at General Assembly and Third Committee, primarily. The Secretary General presents annual report on the situation of human rights to the General Assembly. Um, there has been Security Council briefings also until 2018. Uh, for the last two years, it hasn't happened. Um, and and there, uh, there is a human rights resolution, annual human rights resolutions in the General Assembly, uh, which again, DPRK doesn't... Uh, participate in that uh, because it's a country specific. So anything with this thematic or or universal periodic review or the treaty bodies, DPRK has been engaging on that, although limited, but they have been engaging. Um, but if it is country specific, then they are not. And any, any resolutions, country specific resolutions coming from Human Rights Council, they are not participating in that process. Uh, I think one thing important to note is also uh, DPRK has proactively engaged with international human rights mechanisms, particularly when there is um, better relations, or I wouldn't say better relations, but at least there is open dialogue between the North and South Korea. So if you see the engagement was m pretty much higher during 2001 to 5, which I suppose was also during a sunshine policy. Uh, and then again, if you see the engagement again resumed from 2016 onwards until 2018-19. So uh, it was again during the rapprochement between the two Korea. So I think I think the the peace process does definitely have some. Uh, it might be coincidental, but um, I think it does have some. Uh, the DPRK is more interested in, in engaging with international mechanisms when there is a dialogue process. So 
So that's also, I think it's, it's, it's important to look into. So in, in terms of uh, recommendations, what has been the UN, UN human rights mechanisms talking about human health and gender equality? So if you see, uh, the primary uh, UN human rights mechanisms that has been uh, making recommendation on UN hum on women's health in, in the DPRK um, has been the UPR mechanisms, the special rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the DPRK, Thomas Cantana, has been uh, making uh, pretty good recommendations, and his last report was also focused on human rights in the DPRK. Um, the CEDA committee in its uh, concluding observations has also raised gender equality and, and women's health issues. So if you look into past five years, uh, the reports from the human rights mechanisms, they have particularly focused on some of these areas, like reducing inequalities in access to healthcare, uh, improving public health services and achieving universal healthcare. Again, as, as my former presenter uh, mentioned, healthcare is free in the DPRK. However, in practice, the quality as well as access to healthcare differs across the regions. Uh, health services in, and, and that's the analysis again I'm, I'm referring to from the human rights mechanisms huh? uh, and, and some, of, some of our own office analysis. Health services in villages and rural areas are not as good as in Pyongyang. Um, and sometimes um, when we had a discussion with few doctors, uh, they also said that it also differs on, in, on a certain condition on the ability to pay, although it's free. Uh, uh, because the medical professionals are not well paid and there is a dearth of medicians. Um, so the patient themselves has to bring medicians or have to pay money to, to get good treatment. Uh, some of the doctors we spoke with uh, suggested that while they do not turn away the patients, but treatment would definitely depend upon the ability of the patients to pay to the medical institutions. And also due to sanctions and, and, and economic situation, uh, the general concern now is lack of medicines, equipment and electricity, which has been compromising the quality health services in the uh, DPRK, and that's what some of the issues that the um, UN human rights mechanisms has raised. Another important area that the mechanisms has raised is uh, reducing infant, child, and maternal mortality rates, uh, particularly in the provinces and rural areas, because there is a stark differences in the in the maternal mortality and child mortality rates uh, in the urban areas as compared to the rural areas. Yeah, according to recent data actually from UNICEF situation and analysis, about 92% of the women give birth at the hospital and maternal mortality has decreased uh, to around 66 per, um, per 100,000 births. That, that is the 2019 data. Um, it is 39 in Pyongyang, whereas it is 61 in North Wangwei, so you can see the differences. Uh, in terms of the uh, urban to rural places, uh, lack of quality reproductive health services uh, primarily has led to the maternal mortality rate uh, and MMR, as, as according to UN data, it's due to hemorrhage, sepsis and infections. Infant mortality is 12 per thousand live births. It was 19 in 2019, and under five mortality is now 17. This is 2019 data uh, from UNICEF. Uh, so that's that's so. So that's one of the area where the uh, uh, international human rights mechanisms has been uh, raising concerns, but also providing recommendations. Another is the access to reproductive health services including to persons with disabilities and uh, comprehensive sexual and reproductive rights education. Um, so that's another area that the uh, human rights mechanisms has been 
recommending to the DPRK and to the international community as well to support. Um, again, the analysis is that is a limited availability of the modern contraceptive methods, uh, lack of uh, information and counseling on family planning and insufficient incorporation of its appropriate sexual and reproductive health education in the school curricula, uh, which has been some of the concerns raised by the UN human rights mechanisms. Lack of water has, has also been another concern for uh, menstrual hygiene management. Sanitary pads are expensive, um, and sometimes menstruation due to is also seen as shameful and, and also creating stigma for women. And that was one example illustrated by the special rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the DPRK report last year, this year actually in March was that if the bus breaks down, then people calls out because people are somehow blaming the woman uh, who was, yeah, if she was in a menstruation cycle. So that's, that was one example given by uh, the special rapporteur. Ending malnutrition again and safe drinking water and sanitation is another area. Um, according to the 2017 multiple indicators survey, 71% um, of population in urban areas have access to safe drinking water, but it's only 44% in the rural areas. Uh, and 37% of the child deaths in hospital was due to diarrhea. Another cause was uh, pneumonia, but if you see 37% of the child deaths in the hospital was due to diarrhea. And uh, again, if you link it with women, women are burdened to take care of the children as well as to arrange for medical treatment. Uh, lack of food is another concern, and, and that's that's overall concern for the country. 28% uh, of the pregnant and lactating women are found to be undernourished. Uh, malnourishment in children under five is around 45%, and poverty-related and that is the poverty-related disease is pretty high. Nearly one in ten children under five is underweight, and nearly one in five children is stunted. Uh, again, due to food insecurity and inadequate feeding and care practices, as well as limited quality health, water, um, hygiene, and sanitation services. So, if you look into many call it humanitarian, but if, uh, support, but if you look into all these issues, these are all human rights issues, core human rights issues, with which comes under. Um, Women's health and, and, and both sexual and reproductive health, but also overall human health. And that has been the focus of the international human rights mechanisms, including the special rapporteur. If you look into gender equality or, or SDG 5, the most of the re recommendations has been on gender equality. And, and if you see, they have focused on developing plan of action, human empowerment programs addressing gender stereotypes and patriarchal practices. Another is the participation of women in the political and public life. That's, that's why they have primarily focused. Um, again, if you, if you look into the data that was analyzed, and that was some of the data has been given by the DPRK itself from the government. So uh, women are f make up around 51%, 51.5% uh, of the population. And, and the Constitution does provide equality between men and women and non-discrimination based on gender. However, human participation in the public life is, is very low, specifically in, in the decision-making positions. If you see the Supreme Pe People's Assembly, this is the last year data, it's, uh, the human participation is around 15 to 20 percent. The deputies in the Supreme People's Assembly is around 20 percent. Uh, if you see in the presidium, uh, it's one out of 17. If you see in the cabinet, it's two out of 49. And if you see in the state affairs commission, it's one out of 14. So it definitely shows that the human participation in the in the senior leadership is, is pretty low. Uh, the DPRK has said that they're trying their best to increase that number uh, during their discussions, mm, both at the UPR and the uh, CEDAW committee. 
another aspect with the uh, international humorous mechanisms as raised is access of women to higher education. And if you see the 2014 data, uh, it's only 9.9% of women has university level education and the enrollment for women in higher education was around 18%, uh, whereas for men it was 35%. So they have raised why women are finding it difficult to gain access to uh, higher education. So that's one of the issues on gender equality and women empowerment um, uh, the mechanisms has raised. Um, another area, I think the minimum age of marriage to 18 years, that's uh, the DPRK has said that they are working on it. Um, another important area that has been raised is combating trafficking in persons, especially women and children, uh, primarily to China uh, for, for marriages. Uh, if you see some of the discussions we had with the we had with the SKPs who are come to the ROK, there has been some efforts from both China and uh, the DPRK in at least um, combating trafficking. But it's again looked from a very very uh, law enforcement perspective rather than and without any support for. Uh, care for the uh, the woman who has been trafficked or 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 the family. So uh, we have tried to um, push for um, ensuring at least uh, survivors friendly policies uh, and to take into account uh, the victims and their families when combating trafficking in person. So that's another area that has been raised. And again, I will, I, will, I will give you a case studies on, on domestic violence, but um, sexual and gender-based violence, including domestic violence, was another area uh, where uh, the uh, international human rights mechanisms has been raising concerns, specifically uh, even the law on the protection and promotion of the rights of women, which was adopted in 2010, um, are, are the, some of the provisions are not in line with international human rights standards, uh, spe specifically in terms of um, compromise uh, or medi medita mediation with the uh, mediation with the persons who are, who are involved in the domestic violence themselves. So, and another area is also that they have raised is the uh, redress. There is no avenues for redress for. Uh, uh, for women who have faced domestic violence or sexual or gender-based violence. So that's, that's the recommendations um, from the UN Human Rights Mechanisms on Gender Equality. Uh, there are other recommendations, but I picked uh, something obvious and, and, and which has been raised by many different mechanisms. So how does uh, these mechanisms are implemented at the country level? Uh, because um, the international human rights mechanisms works at a more Geneva level or New York level, and, and it's important that those recommendations are translated uh, at the country level. Uh, again, as a, as, a, as a member state, the DPRK has the primary responsibility to implement these recommendations through the national plans and programs, and in some, some cases they have been doing it. Um, uh, According to DPRK, what they have said is the international human rights instruments have the same status as the national legislation and in the event of conflict, provisions most favorable for the realization of the women's rights would prevail. So which, which basically means that the international human rights law, uh, um, specifically with regards to women, uh, has a precedence um, over the national laws, or are, are, are at least equal to the national laws. Uh, the committee has asked for some concrete examples, and I think in the next review that could be the area that the committee might be looking into, uh, or in the next UPR cycle, to have some concrete examples of how that has been uh, implemented, uh, international human rights law has been implemented in terms of gender equality. 
The another national mechanism is the National Committee for the Implementation of the International Human Rights Treaties, which is basically responsible for implementation of the recommendations on liaising with other ministries and also reporting to the treaty bodies. So that's the national mechanisms. UN agencies, member states, and the humanitarian organizations also uses these recommendations to at least implement them at the national level. And, uh, if you see, the UN agencies have a um, UN strategic partnership framework for cooperations, um, and annually they, on the humanitarian support, they have uh, needs and priorities plan, and, and if you see into the DPRK 2020 needs and priority plan, it primarily focuses on SDG 1, 3, and 6. Um, but also they have a lot of programs on, on, on gender equality, uh, primarily in relations to food security, water and sanitation, and health. Um, and also the, the program focuses on strengthening access to healthcare services, uh, neonatal and child health services, and improve access to safe drinking water and sanitation. Uh, many of these programs and plans have taken into consideration recommendations from the UN human rights mechanisms. Similarly, the UN human rights mechanisms also takes into consideration some of the data uh, and the practicality of some of the issues uh, related to gender equality and health uh, while they are doing the review of the DPRK in terms of the implementation of that treaty. So, so those processes are complementary to each other. Next year, the uh, DPRK, uh, it, it was supposed to be this year, but uh, DPRK has said that they, have, they want to postpone it to next year. So the Voluntary National Review uh, under the SDGs implementations could be also be another opportunity uh, to highlight on some of these issues uh, and to uh, and to engage with the DPRK on 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 the human health as well as on gender equality. If you see into the UN Strategic Partnership Framework for Cooperation, uh, this is a document uh, that that is it is it is it is a generic framework of um, for UN and DPRK to engage. And, and what are the priority areas of engagement. If you see sustainable SDGs, human rights based approach, and gender equality as some of the co-programming principles. And this was agreed by the DPRK. This is a document that was agreed together with DPRK. And if you see on women's health related outcomes, it has um, sustained and equitable universal health coverage, enhance services to address maternal and child diseases, and also increase access to and reliable disintegrated humanitarian development data. So the program itself does cover a lot of issues related to human, human health and also takes into account the recommendations from the international human rights mechanisms. There are obviously challenges to implementation, uh, but nevertheless, I think these are the priorities for both the DPRK government and the international community and these are the areas where they have said that we can work together. So, so it's important to push and to make sure that these are implemented as intended. So I have a case studies for two areas where I will particularly focus on. One is on the domestic violence and another is human health in detention. Again, the case studies I'll explain in the context of the recommendations and the issues raised by the uh, international human rights mechanisms. Uh, just for the background on domestic violence, um, interview by our office with people from the DPRK uh, shows that the domestic violence is widespread. Uh, some of the reasons that they said was economic hardship, drug abuse, and patriarchal attitudes. Uh, if you see the MICS report, the multiple indicator report survey done by UNICEF in 2017, 10.8% uh, who men in urban areas and 7.7% who men in rural areas feel justified of violence against themselves. 
if they do not comply with social norms, uh, which is disagreeing with the husband or not properly taking care of children or refusing sex. <laughs> and among men, it is 8.3% in urban areas and 6.5% in rural areas. So uh, that, is, that is a significant portion of men and women who think that domestic violence or violence against women in the household settings is okay. Uh, we have also documented other forms of uh, violence which the international human rights mechanisms has raised, which is um, sexual exploitations of women engaged in uh, commercial activities, which is market activities, um, also during travel, which was also documented by Human Rights Watch. Uh, so there are other areas. Um, there are mechanisms for divorce in, in, uh, in, in DPRK, but again, filing divorce by women is much, much lower than by men. Um, in 2016, it was 2,000 cases of divorce by women, whereas um, in 2017, it was around 1,700. And, uh, I think due to social norms, women are also reluctant to speak family issues publicly, uh, which has also somehow exacerbated domestic violence. And that is, uh, to a certain degree, denial of also from the government that uh, gender-based violence, including sexual exploitation, is happening and is a social issue in the DPRK. So, so that's the context where we are. Um, uh, the, the human rights mechanisms, what are the main issues raised by them? Is basically the law enforcement only takes actions when domestic violence leads to death. So even in situations, um, I have met a woman who, was, who said that she was beaten, and, and, but they normally do not, are not willing to go to the hospitals because of the expenses, but also, also because of the societal image or the pressure, um, and also that the police or do not provide, or the law enforcement do not provide any support in, 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 in not minor cases, but even in major cases, except if somebody dies. Uh, again, victims do not have access to mechanisms to report and seek protection. Uh, the law on the protection and promotion of rights of women, while it's, it's, a, um, it's a good step forward, it also focuses on reconciliations um, then prosecution and accountability for the crimes of gender-based violence is pretty low. So that was some of the issues raised by the uh, international human rights mechanisms in, in the review of the DPRK. Uh, some of the recommendation made were developing a comprehensive plan to address human-specific issues and promoting gender equality, um, establishing mechanisms for protection and reporting, on cases of gender-based violence, uh, provisions um, regarding reconciliation shouldn't be the basis to dismiss any investigation on gender-based violence cases, um, criminalizing all, all forms of gender-based violence, and also um, it has talked about access to justice and to effective remedy, both judicial and non-judicial, legal assistance, victims' protections, as well as legal literacy for women, because many women doesn't even know the laws and, and what can they expect if similar situation happens. And one of the important recommendations I find is that they have, the, especially Shido has made, is that the high level public officials have the moral, at least the moral duty to uh, to challenge the patriarchal attitudes and discriminatory stereotypes, and they shouldn't be mm -hmm. uh, they shouldn't be the one who are practicing that because it, it sends a wrong signal. So that has been also the focus of the uh, CEDA committee. Uh, that's on domestic violence. On on the human health in detention, uh, we did a survey of 636 women who arrived in the ROK in 2018 and 19. And out of them, 27% of them were detained on at least one occasion in the DPRK. So that is a huge human prison population in the DPRK. And many of them were detained for illegal border crossing because nowadays women are involved in trade. Um, 
and, and, and in commercial activities to sustain the families. And some of the key concerns raised by the uh, humorous mechanisms has been, especially in relation to human health in detention, has been insufficient and poor quality of food, lack of privacy, lack of access to sanitation and hygiene, and hard labor, which, which of course all had an impact on the health of the human. Ill treatment and torture in the detention facilities was another concern raised. Uh, if you see, our report shows that many of the detainees who have died in the prisons are either due to lack of access to health or due to malnutrition. Uh, that's, uh, that has been a regular concern. Here. And in the recent recommendation we have, which DPRK has accepted and we will have to work how that can be implemented is allowing humanitarian agencies to provide uh, food at least in the prisons and detention facilities. Uh, if that happens, then I think some of the concerns regarding malnutrition and access to health in the detentions can be rectified. The poor quality of food uh, and malnutrition, as I said, uh, has also led to interruption of the menstruation cycle for many. Um, uh, that, that the law actually provides for safeguards of for women from three months before and seven months after giving birth in case of detention, they can be released. However, there are also um, not recent ones, but until 2015-16, we have incident of cases of abortion or miscarriage through beatings or hard labor. Uh, forced delivery of baby prematurely uh, was also raised. Uh, sexual violence and harassment from guards and interrogation officer in lieu for better treatment, assigning less arduous labor and better food and leniency in cases was also reported. There has been few incidents of rape um, of women uh, detainees by the guards or by the interrogating officers. Another concern with regards to the health was invasive body searches and striped naked in detention facilities, uh, lack of judicial oversight in detention facilities and again no avenues for women to file cases. And in addition to other work compared to men, women are also asked to work auxiliary duties like cleaning, cooking food, washing clothes for guards and officers. So women had to do a bit of more work um, in addition to the regular work that they do. They also do auxiliary services for the uh, guards and the interrogating officers. There has been some comprehensive recommendation from the International Human Rights Mechanisms on the uh, human health in detentions. Um, is actually protection of women in detention from violence providing nutritional food um, and also taking specific needs of the pregnant and breastfeeding woman, uh, the need for supervision by the female guards and also gender sensitive training uh, on how to manage uh, human detainees, also gender sensitive complaints mechanisms for women um, and also ensuring that they are not subject to invasive body search or using alternative m measures like body scanner um, and, and also not um, undertaking forced abortions. Also monitoring of the places of detentions and um, also ensuring that the accommodations for the female detainees meets the requirements for health. I think that's has been the recommendations from the uh, UN Human Rights Mechanisms, primarily by the CEDAW Committee, uh, the Special Rapporteur on the uh, Persons with Disabilities, as well as the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the DPRK. So if you see into some of these issues, like human health in detention or domestic violence, there, there is comprehensive assessment, dialogue, as well as recommendations from the international human rights mechanisms. Some has been agreed upon by DPRK and, and, and I hope they are working on it. But some needs um, continuous advocacy to ensure that some of these concerns are adequately addressed. So I leave it there and thank you very much.
네, 어, 아주 종합적인 발. Thank you very much for such a comprehensive um, presentation. Now we will hear from the two discussants. Should I go first? Uh, yes, please. Yes, please, Dr. Kim. Uh, hello, I am Shin Gun Kim, a professor of Korea University College of Medicine. Uh, actually, yesterday morning, I attended another session, and it was uh, very informative, and I learned a lot from that session. Uh, and also, it was very multidisciplinary. And uh, today, uh, I think I also learned a lot, and I would like to also comment on uh, ways to improve health care situation for women and children uh, in North Korea. And I thank uh, the organizers for inviting me. Uh, so of course, we're talking about improving health uh, of women. And that doesn't just uh, you know, refer to uh, you know health of women, but women's health also affect uh, you know other members of the family, and also the pregnant women uh, and lactating women's health uh, is very important because it also impacts the health of the infant. Uh, and you know there is this uh, concept of reproductive health, and. This is not just limited to the pregnancy and birth of uh, women, but it sh is a more comprehensive concept that has impact uh, for other individuals. Uh, and so uh, with regards to gender equality situation in North Korea, a number of things were uh, mentioned. And I think there are uh, two uh, assumptions that we need to take into consideration. First, uh, you know, North Korea is a socialist uh, country, and in the legislation, uh, gender equality is very much stipulated. However, North Korea is a very patriarchal and very traditional society at the same time, so we need to understand that. Uh, Dr. Kim is pretty uh, aware of it, but uh, you know, wh what do they call husband in North Korea? Uh, so actually, the householder, the head of the household, is the expression that is used in North Korea to refer to the man in the family. So women still refer to uh, the husband as the head of the family. And that is very symbolic of the uh, relationship in the families in North Korea between men and women. And as uh, Dr. Bokarel also outlined, domestic violence is often taken for granted, something that is accepted in North Korea, given this cultural uh, background. Uh, and also for women, you know, their maternity aspect, the motherhood, is emphasized. Uh, for example, Kim Jong Suk, and they also emphasize Shin Sa Im Dang. These leading women figures are emphasized as models uh, for North Korean women to follow. So women are required to serve their husband well and raise the sons to become revolutionary heroes. And also women are required to also work, uh, you know, effectively as a revolutionary worker. So all these requirements are put on women in North Korea. Uh, and I believe empowerment programs for women will be increasingly important for women in North Korea. And, and there are some changes taking place, but as uh, Mr. Pokorel mentioned, uh, the role of women in the governance, and for example, uh, he mentioned about 15 per, only 15 percent of the, uh, the presidium uh, uh, consists of uh, women. So there are uh, some women who are leading figures, Hyun Song Wal, Kim Yeon Jung, uh, and uh, they are, uh, you know, women leaders. Although they're rather exceptional cases, this, these women also show that there are some shift. Uh, and also, the Korean Hospital Association, the president was a, a woman, and Po Gwon and Oh Chun Buk uh, also uh, is another woman leader uh, who is very prominent. So there are some women leaders that are becoming more prominent in North Korea, but still on the whole, uh, we don't have that many women leaders there. Uh, so we need to see 
and to monitor whether North Korea uh, promotes uh, the women's empowerment, uh, not only in words, but also in action. Uh, and uh, contraception rate uh, was referred to by Dr. Kim and how male sterilization uh, was only 0%, whereas uh, the intrauterine uh, device was used primarily as a contraceptive. But actually, this IUD is not really recommended because it has um, risks of infection uh, and could have negative consequences for women's health. But uh, uh, this is more predominant practice in North Korea, so I think that's something to note. Uh, now, North Korea is only an hour and a half away from Seoul. It's only 70 kilometers away from Seoul. And at such a short distance, we have so uh, many infant uh, and children in North Korea who suffer from uh, greater risks of mortality than children in South Korea. And also, uh, there is the significant geographical gap uh, in terms of mortality rates. Uh, and as Dr. Kim mentioned, North Korea uh, has the principle of free health care for all uh, and also emphasizes preventive uh, health care. And they have neighborhood family doctors in the system. But on the whole, the malnutrition uh, is very serious. And so 40 to 50 percent of the population is suffering from malnutrition. And also you talked about how more than 90 percent of the women give birth in the hospitals, but the hospitals themselves uh, are very under furnished. And uh, if there is hemorrhage uh, and if there are some, um, you know, uh, symptoms that uh, require sur emergency surgery to be done for these women. You know, the, s the environment is not uh, fully prepared. And so there are negative consequences for the mortality of uh, the infants and also of the women. So there needs to be more comprehensive efforts. Uh, under the Park geun administration, there was the 1,000-day project. So th th these are efforts uh, required to uh, protect the health of uh, the children for the first 1,000 days since birth. And so this had a focus on maternal and infant uh, health, you know, increasing the nutritional quality for infants and uh, providing postnatal care. Uh, so these kind of... Um, Activities were packaged uh, under the Park Geun-hye administration, uh, and this is something that we could revive and maybe promote because this really it does not is not impacted by sanction. And Dr. Kim uh, mentioned how the system is well planned in North Korea, and that is a definite advantage uh, that North Korea has. Uh, but we do need to have the facilities, equipment to make those the system more operational. Then we will be able to uh, reap real significant results. And one of the things Mr. Pokorel said that I noted, the Korean peace process and uh, also the participation in the international human rights mechanism, that there is a proportionality, um, I think that's natural. The more North Korea participates in the peace process, uh, the more likely that North Korea becomes a normalized, a normal state. Uh, the nuclear issues and the crisis thereof has strengthened the sanctions on North Korea, causing a vicious cycle. And this process, uh, if there is a nuclear issue uh, resolu uh, re if the nuclear issues are resolved, uh, then this would actually start a virtuous cycle for North Korea to engage more with the international human rights mechanisms and improve the overall situation there. Uh, and of the human rights issues for women, I think the right to life and right to health are the most important. And we need to think a lot about these two rights. And of course, we need to monitor the other aspects of human rights, but especially important uh, for women are, I think, the right to life and right to health. And also under the current sanctions, 
there needs to be uh, international effort to promote the right to health and right to life uh, of the people of North Korea. So on the one hand, we need to monitor and we need to criticize and point out what North Korea needs to improve. But on the other hand, we also need to uh, focus on the right to life and right to health and to make uh, efforts and support uh, those rights in North Korea. Uh, and as uh, Mr. Pokerell talked about the uh, how menstruation uh, could be a, a, a source of stigma for women, uh, that shows the traditional nature of North Korean society. And I think education is the key solution to this. Uh, and that has to begin at the very um, low level of education, like at the elementary level. Uh, and as part of the educational intervention that we are thinking of, of course, because of the uh, hardened uh, inter-Korean relations, we're not able to currently take on this effort. Uh, you know, we are thinking of prepare, uh, creating a social enterprise within North Korea where they can actually produce, uh, you know, cotton uh, sanitary napkins uh, for the women and girls. And this can create jobs and income for the North Koreans. And a lot of the products they produce can actually be provided for free for the local schools. And in addition to the menstrual pads, uh, we could also uh, provide uh, hygienic and health-related education, including uh, education to improve the misconceptions about menstruation. So it's not just a humanitarian aid of providing menstrual napkins. I think uh, this can actually create entrepreneurism uh, within North Korea and create jobs, uh, and it provides greater supply of uh, you know, sanitary napkins for the people there. I think this is a very creative and potentially very effective model. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, the group that I belong to uh, is planning to put this project into action once relations thaw. And finally, the... I think it is important to understand the unique aspect of the health issues concerning women. There is the reproductive health. Uh, and also there is menopause. Uh, so there is post-menopause um, health uh, because there is osteoporosis and other issues that come with that. Uh, but in North Korea, because the culture is very patriarchal, uh, you know, these issues are not dealt with very well. Uh, and so we need to have a comprehensive approach that deals with health issues that are specifically impacting the women in North Korea. Uh, if it's possible, I would like to uh, promote, uh, you know, research on women's health and developing solutions for women's health. Uh, in the United States, there is Women's Health Initiative, which gets support from the government, and they conduct a lot of research concerning women's health. And there are many important ideas and solutions generated to improve women's health. And, and that's something that we could do similarly with regards to North Korea. And maybe we could work with the UN organizations to take a comprehensive approach to solving women's health issues. Women are half of the world's population, and no man were born uh, without a mother. So we should remember that women's health is not just uh, an issue for women. It is really important for the future of everyone in the world. With that, I would like to end my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, we will be hearing from Professor uh, Getty. Hello, thank you so much for the invitation to this critical conference. My name is Patricia Getty. I'm at Sungyeonggwan University Law School. I have been deeply interested in North Korean topics for a while, as well as women's rights issues. And so I think the Sustainable Development Goals really offer a new and fresh, um, innovative framework to work with. Human rights has had some issues, as we've already discussed, in terms of how receptive North Korea can be on engaging with this type of, type of language. Sustainable Development Goals, though, has human rights basically embedded within it. And so there are a number of principles 
um, that are that are involved, and I, I think it might be um, worthwhile explaining this for the the broader audience, and that that's that it has a rights, you know, this is basically a rights-based approach to development, and it includes the following principles. First, the express linkage to rights. Second, accountability. Third, empowerment. Fourth, participation. And fifth, non-discrimination and attention to vulnerable people, which is essentially the concept of leaving no one behind. And what I find basically hopeful about the SDGs is that it's uh, it's an arena where where two different um, groups of of activists and uh, you know uh, those who work on humanitarian engagement with North Korea can can come together and sit at the same table to talk about projects that can implement real changes. Um, to improve human rights for the North Korean people um, so that it doesn't have to be so much an, a, a, a device, a div, you know, so much of a divide between uh, human rights activists and uh, those who promote um, engagement on humanitarian or developmental grounds. Uh, there's, there's a lot of battle, battles to be seen there. And so I'm, I'm really thrilled that this type of panel can come together to talk about these these issues. Now, it, it's, it was very nice to hear from the, the presenters about some of the, the potential and the, the bright side to what might be um, happening in terms of shifts in North Korea. So we can see that the mortality rates are improving. We can see that there are professionals that are really deeply caring and want to be skilled, uh, that are highly literate, um, and that there are shifts happening in terms of modern modernization uh, at the at the government level, um, in terms of improving facilities and equipment and information, and of course we are dealing with with um, with mindsets that are, are hard to change in terms of deep patriarchy, but not just patriarchy, there's, uh, there's quite a lot of violence in terms of uh, both public and private life. If you think about how there's very much a, of a, a war mentality or the idea that one must fight for the nation and that everything moves towards that objective of, of fighting, fighting for one's life, for one's, one's nation, one's personhood and, and livelihood. And so this mentality of always having to survive is, is very exhausting and it's traumatic. Um, we are talking about health, but I'm concerned that we're, we're not including mental health in this equation. And so, to me, what's really troubling is the level and the depth of, um, of undiagnosed mental illness in the country. And how can we talk about this? Um, because there's such stigma, really, globally in any country in talking about mental health. But um, how can we also um, fold this into discussions about health for women um, and children, too? Because I think uh, we're also traumatizing um, different, different types of trauma for the different generations of, of North Koreans. So with women, maybe we can tie it into the issue of pregnancy. Maybe we can talk about postpartum depression. Maybe we can start there, because that's a very common phenomenon with uh, childbirth. And then once we can overcome that type of stigma, maybe we can talk about other types of related depression. And then with children who are born with certain um, cognitive illnesses, uh, maybe we can talk, and I'm sure much of it is going undiagnosed. You know, how do we, how do we address things like um, autism, uh, attention deficit disorder, things of that sort, and what kind of medicinal um, you know what kind what kind of remedies are there uh, for for this type of uh, improving health? And so, on the one hand, we can talk about that these types of uh, on the ground program projects to try to insert these um, initiatives. On the other hand, on a more governance level, of course, the topic has been covered on 
on political participation of women. And, and I think, you know, without that, we really will have, a, have difficulty seeing, seeing progress. But if you're, if you're finding leadership at the higher levels, it's not enough to just have one symbolic woman at the top who is, uh, you know, very powerful, but to have uh, more of a majority in the same room who can discuss these types of ideas. Uh, because I've been in rooms where I can bring up some of these ideas, and if I'm the only woman in the room, uh, the idea can fall flat very quickly. <laughs> and so the idea is how much more women can we bring into the room to talk about these types of programs and ideas. And that might be the appeal of some of these initiatives, is to say this is, um, this is a very much a, a women's, you know, if it's a women's health initiative, then to have some kind of requirement. We need at least 75% women in the room to talk about this kind of program. And so I know we're running out of time and I want to have time for questions uh, generally, but maybe I can just uh, throw that back to the dis uh, panelists, um, is that if we're thinking about some of the more technical programs, I think um, I think everyone's hitting it on, you know, hitting it exactly by saying we should focus on the right to health specifically, because no matter what, health connects across the board with, with uh, the whole spectrum of human rights and with the sustainable development goals. So as long as we're trying to make improvement in one area, we will inevitably improve uh, across the range of, of sustainable development goals and uh, different levels of human rights. It's going to be challenging, definitely with North Korea, but I think we start with the, more, the smaller technical uh, programs that can, um, that incentivizes North Korea to participate as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we have heard uh, from three, uh, presenters and uh, also two discussions and that I, as I listened I felt that uh, there was a very good harmonious um, discussion there were issues raised and Mr. Pokerell uh, also provided a comprehensive review of the issues at hand and Professor Kim and Professor Getty also brought out things to take away based on the presentations delivered. So I think this was a very worthwhile um, discussion that has been taking place. We have about 10 minutes left. And uh, there is a question that came through the YouTube channel. So I would like to read that out to you. Uh, and if uh, there is time remaining, after that, I will we'll give some time for each to make a final comment. Uh, and this question goes to Prof, uh, Professor Kim. Thank you very much for the wonderful uh, presentation. And you mentioned that uh, aid and support must be uh, substantial and effective. Uh, and in order for meaningful inter-Korean cooperation to take place, what must take place? Uh, so what is the biggest challenge that hinders uh, cooperation in health? And what are the key uh, uh, tasks? And what are some longer term challenges that we need to address? So could you respond to that question? Uh, well, actually, that was about three questions um, disguised as one. Thank you very much for the question. I think this is a question that would be very difficult even for you know, a high-ranking government official to address. Um, I am not at the center of policy making, uh, nor am I at the center of any sort of negotiation with the North Korean counterparts. So I have uh, limited access to information uh, that can maybe address this question. But after the inter-Korean summit, President Moon has visited North Korea and talked about cooperation with the North Korean counterparts. And because I'm a doctor, uh, actually, I'm interested in, I think there was this initiative to develop new 
drugs uh, based on traditional Korean medicine, and I thought that's an attractive opportunity. And also, uh, you know, I think there was um, an award that North Korean entities won for the development of a medication based on traditional medicine. Well. Uh, North Korea has extensive experience in uh, developing Korean uh, traditional medication uh, and usually the difficult hurdle is the clinical trials uh, and testing for the new drugs. Uh, but in North Korea, because of their practical limitations, they're unable to carry out uh, the clinical trials. So that's why, although they are developing new medication based on traditional medicine, uh, they're unable to really promote this uh, to a broader um, market uh, because you know, other countries will always be suspect of how uh, these uh, drug substances or medicinal herbs have uh, been validated scientifically. So I think maybe that role can be taken up by the South Korean counterparts. Uh, so through that cooperation, we could develop new drugs based on Korean traditional medicine. And I think this can uh, be an effort that uh, can be very meaningful for the broader global community. So maybe participating jointly in new drugs development with North Korea could be something that South Korean um, partners can take on. And for the longer term, uh, so for the longer term, what kind of challenges could we address? Well, I haven't thought about um, that question before, but I attended medical school in North Korea and then again in South Korea, and I realized the pros and cons of the two distinct systems, not only at the medical universities, but also the educational content delivered in the two systems. And sometimes I get these crazy ideas. Maybe the student in the medical schools in South Korea and North Korea to swap places and have uh, participate in exchange programs. Uh, and so we could provide uh, training. Uh, but uh, you know, if professionals were to go uh, to North Korean hospitals and say, you should do this, you should do that, they might be offended. But if the medical schools can uh, participate in exchange programs so that the students can learn uh, about the best practices, I think that would be great. And. Um, the North Korean students can also not only learn about the South Korea's advanced medical system, but in the process, they will also be exposed to the different culture uh, and values that exist in Korean society. So I think in that sense, it could be a very uh, good program. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to give time to our panel members. Uh, however, we only have four minutes left, so I think I need to wrap up. I'm not an expert in this area. However, look, uh, listening to the presentations, uh, something came to mind. And so I would like to share that with you and then to end uh, this uh, session. I enjoy watching a program called Planet uh, broadcast by BBC. And uh, it shows that in the animal kingdom, uh, females need to, be, need to be successful for that species to flourish. And uh, so uh, women's health and welfare will be the basis and foundation for our society's uh, sustainability. And if we summarize SDG 3 and 5, one is about uh, welfare of uh, women, and uh, uh, the next is about uh, the right of women to be active, to carry out activities, in, whether it be in politics or in other fields. And uh, these two, I think, need to go hand in hand. Directly, we need to first improve the welfare of women. And uh, we saw the Me Too movement uh, that uh, uh, tries to enhance the activities of women. And uh, uh, some uh, 
said that because DPRK is a socialist country, it has a stronger uh, basis for equality, uh, gender equality. Uh, and we need systems to support uh, these um, activities. And in a democratic society, uh, changing the institutions, it's really difficult because uh, people with different interests, they pursue their own interest. And you have to go to a majority ruling, which uh, is complicated and takes a lot of time. But uh, DPRK is different. It's uh, can be institutions and systems can be changed overnight if there is the will of the leader and women's human rights and women's welfare if it is needed for the sustainability of DPRK. Um, uh, once the leader decides on it, actually they can quickly create the um, um, like infrastructure for that. And uh, I think that in this area, the role of the United Nations is very important because the United Nations may uh, use their influence to um, help uh, Chairman uh, Kim Jong-un to change his thoughts. And uh, this might be far-fetched, but uh, I think that uh, if there is the will from the leadership, then there can be changes um, faster than other countries in DPRK. And uh, we heard uh, from uh, the speakers and uh, the discussants. Some were here in person and some asked questions via um, Zoom and online. So I want to thank all of the participants, uh, whether they were here in person or uh, they are joining online. I want to ask you to give our presenters and uh, discussants a big hand. With this, we will complete today's se this session. Thank you.